As we start our next section on electrochemistry, let's first ask, what is electrochemistry? It is the study of chemical reactions that can generate electricity and perform electrical work by moving electrons. Now, these reactions involve the transfer of electrons from one species to another, and they are also called redox reactions. The word redox is actually a combination shorthand for reduction oxidation. As a review, redox reactions move electrons from one species to another, so both oxidation and reduction are occurring simultaneously. Oxidation refers to the loss of electrons, while reduction refers to the gain of electrons. So you can think of oxidation and reduction as each being a half reaction that together makes a whole redox reaction. Two other key words are oxidizing agent and reducing agent. These are sometimes more simply called the oxidant and the reductant. The oxidant is the species that's doing the oxidizing action. So it gains electrons and gets reduced. The reducing agent, on the other hand, is the species that's doing the reducing action. And so it's going to lose electrons and gets oxidized. So this can be a little confusing because you can see by my color code here that the oxidizing agent participates in the reduction because it gets reduced, whereas the reducing agent participates in the oxidation because it gets oxidized. Before diving into redox reactions, I want to revisit acid-base reactions as an analogy to what we will learn here. So in an acid-base reaction, we have the transfer of a proton from one species to another. And if you recall, in an acid-base reaction, we have both an acid and a base as reactants to form their conjugate acid and base products. And so we can think of this proton transfer as in two half reactions. One half of the reaction, let's say ammonia and its conjugate acid ammonium, is gaining a proton. And in the second half reaction, water is losing a proton to form its conjugate base hydroxide. So in essence, the gain and loss of a proton occurs simultaneously when ammonia takes this proton from water to form these two products. Here is the acid-base reaction written in a generic form. So base plus the acid HA to form these products. Now this overall reaction can be split into two half reactions. For example, in the first half reaction, this could be the base gaining a proton to form its conjugate acid. In the second half reaction, the acid HA loses a proton to form its conjugate base A-. And if we were to sum these two half reactions, we would notice that proton appears both on the left and on the right side of the equations. So they can cancel out, and what we get is what we started with the overall reaction of a proton transfer. We can apply those concepts also to redox reactions, but rather instead of one proton, we can apply to the transfer of electrons, whether one or multiple. So here's an example redox reaction where zinc metal reacts with copper 2 plus ions to form the zinc plus 2 ion and copper metal. So we can again think about this as two half reactions. So the zinc turning to zinc plus two is losing electrons, and this is the oxidation. The copper two plus that turns into copper metal is gaining electron, and so this is called the reduction. A handy way to remember what is oxidation versus what is reduction, here's a handy 
mnemonic called oil rig. Oil is an acronym for oxidation is loss, and rig stands for reduction is gain. So both of these are referring to electrons. Now in this redox reaction, we can look at our two reactants, zinc metal and copper plus two. The zinc metal is behaving as a reducing agent because it reduces the copper plus two. So by giving up electrons to copper plus two, the zinc metal gets oxidized to form zinc plus two. Now copper two plus is the oxidizing agent because it's oxidizing the other reactant zinc. And by removing electrons from zinc, copper itself gets reduced to copper metal. One joke I found on the web is this chemistry cat meme. What did the oxidizing agent say to the reducing agent? Your loss. The redox reaction can be split into two half reactions. So in this example given here, I can write this as a sum of these two half reactions. The first half reaction is the oxidation reaction where zinc metal loses electrons to form zinc plus two cation. And because of the plus two charge, I need to balance that out with two electrons also as my product. In the second half reaction, copper two plus is being reduced, gaining electrons to form copper metal. And again, this will require two electrons. And this is the reduction half reaction. So I can sum these two half reactions. And you'll notice that two electrons are located on both sides of the chemical reaction. And so they can cancel out. And what I get as an overall reaction, or my overall redox reaction, is the one that I started with. Here are two examples of redox reactions. This first reaction is called the thermite reaction, where iron oxide, or rust, reacts with aluminum metal to form iron metal and aluminum oxide. The second reaction is really the combustion of methane. So methane reacts with oxygen to form water and carbon dioxide. So one way of keeping track of where the electrons are moving is to use a formalism called the oxidation number. This is just the charge of an atom if all the bonds around it are ionic. And so keep in mind that this is just a formalism to help us identify what is the reducing agent and what is the oxidizing agent. In this first reaction example, it's the iron and aluminum atoms that are changing oxidation numbers. So this is where electrons are being lost or gained. So iron oxide, the iron has an oxidation number plus three. And as it turns into iron metal, the oxidation number goes to zero. Aluminum does the opposite here. Aluminum metal has an oxidation number of zero but aluminum inside aluminum oxide has an oxidation number of plus three. By following these charges, we can see that the half reaction involving the iron species is a reduction because iron plus three gains electrons to generate iron zero. The aluminum half reaction is the oxidation because aluminum zero loses electrons to form aluminum plus three. So we can say that iron oxide is the oxidizing agent and aluminum metal is the reducing agent. I do wanna emphasize again that oxidation numbers is a formalism and they're not necessarily realistic. Now they can be somewhat realistic if the compounds do actually have highly ionic bonds. So this is somewhat true for iron oxide and aluminum oxide, where the iron oxygen and aluminum oxygen bonds have a high ionic character. And so realistically, we do think of iron 
inside iron oxide as having a plus three charge. However, oxidation number formalism really falls apart when compounds are highly covalent. And so in the second example, where we have oxygen and methane forming water and carbon dioxide. And these bonds between carbon and hydrogen or hydrogen oxygen or carbon oxygen are very covalent. And so we can look at oxidation numbers simply as a way of keeping count of electrons and where they move. And so in dioxygen, we have an oxidation number of zero for those O atoms. But then in water, that oxidation number changes to minus two. Now the carbon in methane formally is minus four, but the carbon in CO2 is formally plus four. So these oxidation numbers help us identify that oxygen is undergoing reduction to form water, whereas methane is undergoing oxidation to form carbon dioxide. And so O2 is the oxidizing agent and methane is the reducing agent. Finding an oxidation number depends on certain rules and these are covered in chapter four. But here's a handy table to remind you what those rules are. So at the top we have general rules and at the bottom we have rules for specific groups or atoms. So we'll go through these one by one with examples. The first rule is that an atom in its elemental form has an oxidation number of zero. So all metals in their elemental form have an oxidation number of zero. But even molecules like oxygen, the oxygen atom has an oxidation number of zero. The next rule is that a monatomic ion, the charge of that ion is its oxidation number. So for example, we can talk about a calcium plus two ion. And so this is a monatomic ion and that plus two charge means the oxidation number of calcium is also plus two. The third rule I'm gonna come back to, so we'll skip it for now. Moving into this next section, here we have specific rules. For group one metals, the oxidation number will be plus one in compounds. And so an example of a compound with a group one metal is the salt sodium chloride. And the sodium has an oxidation number of plus one. Now for group two metals, the oxidation number will be plus two. So example would be magnesium oxide Magnesium is a group two metal, so the oxidation number of magnesium will also be plus two. For hydrogen, we have two different rules. Mostly hydrogen has an oxidation number of plus one. So for instance, in a CH bond, that hydrogen would be plus one. In an OH bond, that hydrogen would be plus one. So really in combination with many non-metals. Hydrogen, on the other hand, changes oxidation number to minus one when it's combined with metals or boron. And that's because these metals and boron are extremely electropositive. And so the electrons will more prefer to reside on hydrogen. So here's two examples, methane. In methane, carbon is a non-metal, so the hydrogen oxidation number will be plus one for each of these hydrogen atoms. In calcium dihydride, calcium is a group two metal. It's extremely electropositive. And so hydrogen here has an oxidation number of minus one for each of those hydrogen atoms. In the next rule, we're gonna to move to oxygen, fluorine, and halides. So for fluorine, the oxidation number is minus one. An example of this would be HF, where F 
the fluorine atom has an oxidation number of minus one. Oxygen has two rules. Most oxygen oxidation numbers will be minus two. There is an exception for fluoride. Another exception is when there is an OO bond, like in a peroxide. In that case, the oxygen oxidation number is just minus one. So here are some examples. So I'll start with the common place where magnesium oxide or carbon dioxide, the oxygen oxidation number will be minus two in both of these cases for each of those O atoms. So again, there is an exception if oxygen is bound to another oxygen atom. And for instance, in this peroxide, each of those oxygen atoms has an oxidation number of minus one. For the halides, these tend to have an oxidation number of minus one when combined with metals and nonmetals and other halogens lower in the group, and the only exception is oxygen. So predominantly, for instance, chloride in HCl, that chlorine atom has an oxidation number of minus one, and in carbon tetrachloride, that each of those chlorine atoms also has an oxidation number of minus one. Let's return to this third rule that states the sum of the oxidation number values for the atoms in a molecule will equal zero if that molecule is neutral. Now, if it's a polyatomic ion and there is a charge, then the sum of the oxidation number values should equal to the overall charge. So let's use this rule and apply it to two of the examples we've talked about so far. So methane and carbon dioxide. Previously, we said that in methane, those hydrogen atoms will have an oxidation number of plus one. And so the carbon oxidation number plus the four oxidation numbers of those hydrogen atoms should sum to zero. And that means then that the carbon atom has an oxidation number of minus four. For CO2, the sum of oxidation number values should also be zero. And here, each of these oxygen atoms has an oxidation number of minus two, and there's two of them. So then the carbon oxidation number value must be plus four, such that the sum of all the oxidation number values of these atoms will sum to zero. And so you can see that carbon in these two molecules is formally minus four in methane and plus four in carbon dioxide. To practice assigning oxidation numbers, let's return to those two examples of redox reactions. So the first rule states that anything in its elemental form will have an oxidation number of zero. And so we can put in zero for aluminum metal, iron metal, and dioxygen. Next, we can look at the oxygen atoms. And, and so typically, the oxidation number for an O atom is minus 2, except if it's an OO bond, it's minus 1. So these molecules have iron O bonds, aluminum O bonds, CO bonds, or OH bonds. So in all these cases, all those oxygen atoms each have an oxidation number of minus two. Lastly, we can look at the hydrogen atoms. And again, when hydrogen is bonded to a metal, it's minus one. But when it's bound to a non-metal, like carbon or oxygen, it's plus one. And so we can write plus one and plus one for the hydrogen atoms in these molecules. Now we're ready to sign the missing oxidation numbers like for iron in iron oxide. Here we're going to apply rule number three that states the sum of all the oxidation numbers for all atoms in the molecule will sum to zero. And so we can write that as two times the iron oxidation number plus three times the oxygen oxidation number equal to zero.
and use this to solve for the iron oxidation number. And that gives us a value of plus three. Because aluminum oxide has a similar formula, we can write a similar equation and that will yield that the aluminum oxidation number in aluminum oxide is also plus three. Coming down to examples below, we had done this in the earlier slide, but now it's here written out where the carbon in methane must be minus four, such that the sum of all oxidation numbers in this molecule will equal zero. And for carbon dioxide, now the carbon oxidation number is plus four, such that the sum again will equal zero. So by looking at the changes in oxidation number on these central atoms like iron and oxygen, we can see that these atoms gain electrons and so they're participating in the reduction. On the other hand, the aluminum atoms and the carbon atoms, they're losing electrons. And so these are participating in the oxidation reactions. Lastly, as a quick note, for iron oxide and aluminum oxide, having an oxidation number of plus three for these metals is reasonably realistic. However, again, for methane and carbon dioxide, the carbon is not formally minus four in methane or plus four in CO2, and that's because these molecules are highly covalent. On my last slide, let's practice determining the oxidation number for the central atoms in each of these polyatomic ions, where now we do have a non-zero overall charge. So this is permanganate, chromate, whose structure is shown here, oxalate, and this is the structure of oxalate here, and carbonate. Just to keep things easy, all the surrounding atoms are oxygen atoms. And we know that with the exception of peroxides, oxygen atoms tend to have an oxidation number of minus two. And that would be the case for all of these examples. So now we can use rule number three to figure out the oxidation number of each of these central atoms. In this first example, we have the manganese oxidation number summed with all the four oxidation numbers of oxygen. So four times minus two, and that will be equal to the overall charge of this ion, which is minus one. So solving this, we find that the manganese oxidation number is minus one plus eight or plus seven. In the next example for chromate, now we can write a similar equation, but be mindful that there's two chromium atoms. And so we have two times the chromium oxidation number plus seven times minus two for all those oxygen atoms. And now that's equal to the overall charge, which is minus two. So simplifying this, we find that the two chromium atoms together, their oxidation numbers will sum to plus 12. And so that means each of the chromium atoms has an oxidation number of plus six. These next two examples feature carbon. And again, in oxalate, we can write a similar equation where two of the carbon oxidation numbers summed with four of the oxygen oxidation numbers will equal to the overall charge of minus two. And we can simplify this further to show that two of the carbon oxidation numbers will be equal to plus six, which means then that for each carbon atom, their oxidation number is plus three. Finally, in carbonate, again, we can write this equation and we will find that in carbonate, the oxidation number for this carbon atom is plus four.